And in the studio together, mm. forever, maybe, mm. Mr. Brian Brushwood <laughs> and Justin Robert Young. I mean, yeah. you guys could die there. Who knows? Will they, won't they? <laughs> <laughs> Will he, won't he uh, commit kidnapping? <laughs> You know, Justin, yes. it's lonely around here, and, <laughs> and, and I've decided for us both. Yeah. <laughs> locks the door. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I am staying at his compound where he does control the locks, so <laughs> this true. is not infeasible. <laughs> Speaking of which, I, I, I think you left the door unlocked on your way out today. Uh, well, I know that the construction guys have been coming in. Oh, uh, yeah. got it. Okay, all right. Yeah. So good. As long as that was a Wait, known issue. construction guys? What construction guys? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there hasn't been construction on that constru- property for yeah. 50 I mean, years. In, in, <laughs> yeah, it, it just, I, in case, all right, so I'm staying in Brian's compound, which at one point that will be. It doesn't sound good to begin with. I, I'm just going to say, at one point it will be a gleaming, shining compound that the internet will know and revere, and there'll be a tremendous worth in me talking about how I was the earliest uh, uh, multiple night guest, and I'll feel very good about myself. For right now, it is an increasingly complicated, abandoned house that looks <laughs> ever more dangerous and complicated, up to and including the fact that. Last night I show up, and because they are building a warehouse uh, uh, on the property, uh, I come back in, and the place where I had left, or I'd previously been working on my laptop, it had been like my own little desk in this, in this large studio area, now just had a bandsaw. <laughs> <laughs> so it, was, it was just or not, or a handsaw, not a bandsaw, just a, a gigantic handsaw, and also there was a, 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 a plug that had been running in from the outdoors. Yeah, that made me like not know whether or not people were there. So oh, now, no. so now, so now you have to sweep the house. So now I'm like, hello, <laughs> hello. It's like this. This is how people get murdered. Like yeah. this is exactly. I'm doing everything as I'm turning on my phone light to light the I, way. <laughs> I've only stayed the night there like two or three times, and each time, like it is, it is spooky enough. It's gonna take a while to get over that hump and make it feel like a safe, nice home to be in. Like, Lights would help. Yeah. <laughs> also, uh, 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 windows uh, that are broken replaced. <laughs> because, and also, like, it's got the, those old plate glass windows, like, not tempered glass, no. not safe in any way. And it's like, uh, when you move too fast, it changes the air pressure in the room just enough that this precariously balanced windowsill goes, and so, and so when, and whenever, and so, in the middle of the night, you you're sleeping perfectly still, and then you hear and you're like, that's what would happen if the door just fucking opened. Oops. Yes, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Let's yeah. Do a, a quick Google News search of the top entries for the word compound. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, number one, Mark Zuckerberg wants to build a massive compound in Lake Tahoe. Okay. okay. Uh. Let's go next one. Uh, new compound of New Mexico jihadi cultists found in Alabama. Okay, <laughs> okay all right. Not a good right. compound. Uh, actor Kristen Davis looks to sell her leafy Brentwood compound. A good compound. That's good. That's good, a good, good compound. compound. Yeah, that's, right. that's, that's one for the good compound. guys. Good compound. Eh, maybe not so good. Oh. Uh, this remote compound in Sierra Nevada looks like a good one. Uh, a military compound in South Korea. And the last one, Israel hits Hamas compound. Yeah. Uh, We're bad. Yeah, that's a little above. That's a sub 500 record on compound. I, I mean, look, I, I, that's why we're trying to read. We're taking compound back, man. <laughs> it's, it's our like, word now. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I was a guest at Brian's compound. It sounds a lot <laughs> like I was at rehabilitation training at Scientology at the compound. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you're saying we might need a little uh, a little PR sprinkle of pass, uh, uh, pass of paint on there, huh? No, actually the opposite. I'm saying I think you need to talk to a tax lawyer because I think we found a new angle. <laughs> that's, that's, that's yeah, a good exactly. point. Actually, how, many, how many more tax credits do I get oh, hold for, on. for compounds? How, how hard would it be to make it a religion? <laughs> the, the, the diamond this club. is how it happens. It's <laughs> literally <laughs> happening right now. <laughs> Uh, gentlemen, yeah. um, we uh, just mentioned this right before the show. Today was the IPO for Beyond Meat. Mm-hmm. Beyond Meat is the meat substitute company, and they had a an, a, an amazing IPO. They uh, went up 135 percent, and they make uh, a number of you know these these meat substitutes that 
are pretty good. And you also have Beyond Meats, one company, and then you also have, I believe it's uh, Impossible, Impossible Foods. Is yeah, Impossible another Foods. Another rival, right? Yeah, uh, so uh, those are the two that have really gone the most mainstream. Uh, Beyond Meat, you can now get a Beyond Meat burger at Carl's Jr. Uh, and Impossible Foods recently partnered with Burger King to do a test run of the Impossible Whopper at, uh, I think it was uh, St. Louis, and now there was an announcement this week, probably to kind of get in on this IPO, this, this Beyond Meat IPO hype, that... Uh, that Burger King is going to go nationwide with the Impossible Whopper. So you're going to be able to get a fully non-meat or, you know, vegan, vegetarian uh, experience at your local Burger King. So. What What is the nuts and bolts? Because uh, I know that, that the spectrum ranges from, you know, like cultured uh, actual meats uh, where, where you grow ground beef cells or or you could do, uh, I don't know, all the soy substitutes or whatever. Yeah, like, so like, this, is all, this is all... This is not cloning or anything like that. This is uh, a actual uh, meat substitute stuff. So this is all the soy. I, I forget exactly what is in the Impossible Burger. But Pete, the, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, the, the the Impossible Burger uh, got famous because it was a patty that when you threw it on the grill, it would bleed. Like it would have a red thing and they had like some yeah, beet it's, element it's, to it's, it. Uh, heme is uh, everybody yep. when you, when you cut open a steak uh, you think of it as blood but it's not that's actually heme and uh, it turns out that they were able to synthesize heme from some plant or other so it uh, you get that bloody tasty yeah. taste. Yeah. And and uh, I'll say this uh, Impossible Burger just did their second I eat a lot of these by the way because my wife's vegan so I'm I'm very familiar with this with this uh, level of cuisine. I would say Impossible Burger is very much a step up from somebody who also eats beef uh, from the Beyond Meat Burger but the new version of the Impossible Burger which they actually debuted at CES because they wanted to brand it as like food tech uh, kind of just tastes like a okay burger. It's not the best burger, but it certainly tastes like something that you would have at a at a Burger King. I think it's going to be it's going to play really really well with the Whopper crowd because it just sort of tastes like a pre-made patty of of beef. It's it's pretty impressive. Let me give a little bit of background on why there's a push to this, besides from the fact that there are people that are looking for meat alternatives, but we still, for some reason, we want these alternatives, but our our our, our, our bodies love the taste of meat, um, which maybe it's telling us something. There is, if you look at the environmental impact on raising cattle, raising beef, and agriculture in general, there's, there's impact from having large fields, things like this too, but agriculture, when particularly cattle, um, uses an intense amount of water, it produces a lot of methane, a lot of transportation is involved, it's an area that if you can make it much more efficient would be wonderful, would have a lower impact. You could start using you know, certain lands for other purposes, et cetera. And there's a drive right now. We're seeing the first sort of good wave of substitutes that are these plant-based ones. There's the next wave, which Brian pointed out, are going to be the ones where they're actually going to use cellular material from animals to you know grow steaks, grow things. And that's been something they're working on in the lab. But right now, the plant-based ones are coming along pretty well. And in theory, you keep driving this technology, the costs get lower and lower and lower and lower, and we'll probably reach a point maybe in the next few years where we're going to see an acceleration of the lowering of this cost faster than regular meat, things like this. So my question is, are we going to see uh, 2019, are we going to see maybe in the next four or five years where this might become the norm? I mean, that's certainly what Asimov predicted in Caves of Steel. You know, they're, they're like, uh, the, I think they were saying that everything was made of yeast, and there were people who were like, hey, last year, remember when we got a bumper crop of strawberries? Psych, yeah. that was actually all yeast. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I think instead of the norm, I, I think in five years we can hope for cost parity in certain commodities like ground beef. Um I think in another five years after that, 10 years, we're looking for like that becomes the cheaper alternative, at which point then it becomes more of a runaway success. Assuming I, I'm assuming all of this is lower environmental impact as well, because yeah. as yeah. we get closer to whether it be cap and trade or whatever kind of uh, real enforcement of climate, uh, you know, CO2 emissions it's going to be way more uh, attractive to make this the default option, 
which will set up a weird moment where it's like, how do you justify continuing to eat meat? I mean, you, you at that point, eating real meat until, and we're talking not cloned whatevers, but eating me real meat suddenly becomes a luxury that you can only justify based on taste because you can't justify like, oh, I wish I could afford an impossible burger and a clean conscience, but I, but I can't. So, so, so it becomes more like veal or foie gras or something like that where, where it is more expensive and, and it comes with some kind of moral question that you have to ask yourself. Yeah, yeah and I think it'll be another five years after that. So, so yeah, five yeah. years. Because even, even to meat eaters... There's a question with certain like like like, like, like right. foie gras and veal or something like that. Even though we have all made peace with like okay, factory farming is a thing, uh, right? Uh, and there are animals that are raised to be slaughtered. That's fine. This is like uh, the way civilization has run. But then it's like oh, but a little baby veal, <laughs> like, <laughs> like that. That brings a, another question mark in foie gras. Similarly, so you know you're saying that that just like that stigma then. Grows out. Yeah, I think. Okay, so five years out, I think we hit price parity. Ten years out, I think we. Uh, it, it. It. All of a sudden, the default option becomes. You know, it, it, unleaded versus premium. You know. Yeah. Uh, and then fifteen years is where. Uh, people start saying, yeah, I know I should have the Impossible Burger, but oh my God, it's just so good. To, mm, I want that, yeah. that that real beef. And then once once the lab grown meat twenty years from now starts becoming an option then it's like then then we hit a burger is a, a, what we consider the default traditional burger becomes a, f a foie gras question I mean uh, here here's what I will say with the impossible foods uh burger and and beyond meat and beyond sausage there are a few things for which we're getting close to if this were the cheaper option you could sell them in mass quantities that is uh anything with ground beef right and anything with sausage. And I would say even with the Impossible Foods, you can really actually crumble that up, and it it does do very well as like a pulled pork kind of thing. I mean, I, like it, there it, there are, there are a few of those. If it's highly seasoned, and we don't have an expectation as to mouth feel like we do with a steak or something like that, yep. or even a burger, if it's just filling, I, I'll tell you, you can throw some of that Impossible. And I hate this within in the vegan and like meat substitute community. People are like, "Oh, it's exactly the same." It ain't. Even the even the Impossible <laughs> Burger is not right. No, there's good, there's passable, but when it comes to ground uh, beef or sausage, we're not far away from it being which brings in, us in, in, indistinguishable. Which brings us to the real question to put to bring it to Andrew's wheelhouse. If tomorrow Taco Bell started offering the impossible soft taco would 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 that and and let's say the price was the same i guess we would also have to speculate on how good it tastes but like like would, uh, would i i love the idea because it's it's oh there's a lot of filler in that in that oh spice yeah beef anyway. I, I, I think the advantages over these meats is that in theory it's going to be healthier right yeah i i brian your timeline may be accurate i mean i don't know I think it may be more aggressive because I think once we get a couple more players in the market and, and you know, we, you know, and, and I've been listening to these, you know, audio books and stuff talking about like, you know, like price to where you want it to be, not what it costs right now. Like, you know, like what they did with the first like silicon, you know, the microchips, things like this. If you get a big well-backed fund, you know, thing that company that says, you know, if we're selling, you know, a hundred million pounds a year, we can produce, we can put our price at half that of ground beef. Let's just go ahead and start selling it at that price now and take over the market. You know, it could be very aggressive. I, I, I could I could see really sooner than later that you go to a burger place and it is it is the norm that it's non meat. But you can you know, the, the premium fancier burgers are the real meat ones or whatever. But uh, well, yeah, and, you and, ask if Taco Bell replaced it. Sure. And also, this isn't just necessarily a restaurant issue because I, I don't believe Beyond Meat has at least their full range of products out in grocery stores. Impossible Foods definitely does not have their uh, uh, any of their products out in grocery stores, and that's even in the like Whole Foods way. Okay, yeah, I guess uh, Beyond Meat does have have their burger there, but Impossible Foods does not, uh, and and that's a whole nother element of you know uh, uh, now all of a sudden if if a kid wants to go vegetarian, it's not the it's not the end of the world. If, if the family wants to start eating healthier, it's not the end of the world. You're still growing burgers. They're, they're still out there. Like, uh, uh, And you could even throw 
cheese on it uh, uh, if you want. And it's like, okay, well, still, I'm I'm not strictly because that's actually what Impossible Foods did with the Impossible Burger. They did not market it as a vegan thing. Yes, they, which, they, which I think is the brilliant move yeah, on their part. They, they they marketed it as a health thing that they went to and partnered with all these specific restaurants that were all cooking it their own specific way mm -hmm. uh and and now that has extended uh, expanded to like burger king so what what do you think uh, i'm sure that that the cattle industry is not yet shaking in their boots but five years ten years they may be and but we're already starting to see I mean, the, the, the the dairy industry is like they they're currently fighting for like what uh what milk means what, and that's exactly yeah. what i wanted to bring up because we've already seen this battle where they they moved to legislation to prevent the, uh, anyone from calling it almond milk or soy milk or rice milk, and uh, which is insane. They're like, no, milk is a thing that comes out of a cow's udder. It's like, well, no, milk is is uh, you know a white white tasty stuff you put in your cereal. Uh, and it's like, why don't we call your product cow juice from now on? <laughs> and we're getting we're gonna get the nut like, juice and cow juice. <laughs> right, exactly. But but we're already like, none of y'all deserve milk. <laughs> Until you can settle it, boys, you're both juice. <laughs> Which, it kind of breaks my heart because you're seeing product names change, you know, to like silk because it sounds kind of like soy milk. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, 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 we're already, I forget what it was, like, there, there's one faction that wants to call it clean meat. Uh, and this is specifically about lab-grown meat. There are some people that said, no, you're not allowed to call it meat. You got to call it like, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, sell sell slop made in a dish <laughs> and, uh, and rolls then, right off the tongue. Yeah, I, I mean that's not. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, is we're we're gonna find this weird branding argument, and and there's legal, uh, there's legal hammers being used on all this. Now, yeah, somebody pointed out like what's happened. I was at Whole Foods with my buddy Peter, and he's talking about the whole milk thing. Like he's like, "Oh yeah, they won the lawsuit." I'm like, uh, "Are you sure?" He's like, oh, "I don't, I don't know if they actually did or whatever." But we walked into the dairy aisle, and what I thought was soy milk was soy milk. They had combined the letters from every like all the brands now was instead of almond milk, it's almond milk. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So technically, they're not calling it milk; they're calling it soy milk. Yeah. As a, oh, and interesting. I, I, and it's a it's a it's I think it's a dumb battle for the dairy industry to do that because it's like, you know, like there's a lot of precedent for other things that, you know, milk of magnesia, all this sort of stuff. Great. Great. You won this. Now what? Uh, you know, um, uh, so that's cool. Like we just saw federal court rules that almond milk is milk. And so that it looks like they it was a proactive. Let's change the names just to be careful. Um, but you know, like, yeah, you're going to get, is that, the, is that the battle they want to fight? And it, yeah, it will be because they're, they have a ton of money. They have a ton of litigators. They'll be like, Hey, let's go try to do this. Let's, let's try to, you know, come up with a new, let's change the names. Cause that'll stop it. You know, which is well, th dumb. that, that is a, that is a an understandable move. I'm not going to say it's a good one or a sensible one even, but it's an understandable move for the dominant player to make. Like when you've got well, the money, the resources and and, and and talk about an industry trying to protect itself. Uh, have you guys heard of the 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 great beer alliance that wasn't? No. So uh, there was there was set to be negotiations were well underway for all the major beer players to launch a massive got milk style campaign extolling the virtues of beer because okay. beer has fallen so far over the last decade to wine and spirits that beer is looked at as unhealthy and that the market has kind of stratted so much so, so they carbs. yeah yeah they are facing a a crisis in terms especially going forward with the trends of younger uh, uh, uh you know people that are now becoming drinking age uh and then it all fell to crap because bud light decided to pick their uh corn uh, you know, they're really late, yeah. that was that was the moment in which uh, I guess uh, Miller Coors said, like, well, we can't deal with these people. Uh, uh, they're like they're 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 demonizing the the very elements of beer. And so it all fell apart. But, but there was a, a moment in which they were going to all unite together and just talk about how rad beer was. Uh, for the record, that was that was a pretty na nasty trick and continues to be an awful uh, distortion of uh, in marketing. Like yeah. that that seems like an out of bounds uh, play. So for, uh, for the uninitiated, uh, Bud Light says. Um, 
uh, they use corn syrup over at Light Miller Light, so therefore it must be bad because we all have heard that corn syrup is bad. Or, but the but they are talking about what foods, what sugars they feed the uh, yeast, and so I guess at most you could imply that the yeast got fat and and had unhealthy lives as they before they died, <laughs> squeezing out the exact same ethanol <laughs> used in the in their beer. It's uh it's it's awful science and uh in Oh I would have expected so much more from the wackety schmackety medieval players that <laughs> decided to levy such a charge. This well, was... well but, but it was an out of nowhere Oh, it was a side swipe. It, yeah. it was it was it was a multi phase because they, they previously made this big deal about how oh we have a label we have a, an ingredients label everyone should have an everything has an ingredients label we're proactively putting an ingredients label and then at the biggest possible visibility point they decided to say oh. Here's an ingredient that's in their thing that they're not telling you about. You can always see what's in a can of Bud Light. It was it was dirty, but they, they basically, I guess, at the point that they all knew that they were at a crisis point, decided to be like, yeah, no, and it's only us. Ship, 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 ship. <laughs> it's, they, man, Wild they, card. They, they really committed to this whole Game of Thrones aesthetic. They were, yeah. They, 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 they beer wedding the entire thing. <laughs> Well, as far as what's going to happen in reaction to this, like if certainly, you know, the, you know, meat groups, whatever, are going to pro- we're going to see pushback. Then, you know, you kind of got to look at who owns them, whatever, and, and what happens there. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the, you know, the meat industry is really, you know, we mentioned, you know, uh, corn syrup before. It's corn based. What are the corn producers? You know, are the corn producers involved in this cycle or not? You know, that that underlies so much of our economy. So, um it's, yeah, yeah. It'll... There, there was that uh, that documentary. King Corn was was interesting, and what I respected about that documentary was that it uh, it started off looking like a hit piece, but ended with the real question of like, well, what do we do? Go back to before subsidies where we were paying people to not grow food? I mean, that's that's insane. And so, but uh, uh, it's it's all a thorny, interconnected issue. So, so to the the, the meat substitute thing, Andrew. Uh, you would suspect because you, you were you, you made mention earlier that this really heightens up as soon as we get more players in there. Uh, you would suspect that a gigantic IPO from Beyond Meat, and then surely what will follow is another even larger IPO from Impossible Foods, with the promise of rolling out to uh, every grocery store. That 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 accelerates that process. This is this is officially no longer speculative play. This is a land rush to see how many people can get in, right? I think we, I think they, they've already won Mindshare. Yeah. I mean, everybody I know has tried this and we've had them and they're like, they're good enough. They're not like, you know, the garbage patties that we had from 10 years ago or whatever. They're like, they, you know, that we got lie. Oh, try this. You know, there are stuff that you go like, you know, like you could eat like, you know, some of these like the bean burgers. We're like, ah, it's okay. But yeah, it's not a burger. It's, it's yeah. just a totally different thing. It's like, now they're getting a lot better. And I've had them. I've had them. And I'm like, ah, it's good enough. You know, some onions and stuff and all this will taste as good as something else. And it's improving. I think that mind shares one. I think that that mind shares one. I don't think that we're revulsed by the idea. And I think that, yeah, if you get some players in there that say, let's drive this cost down. And that is the goal to put the cost below meat because. Yeah. Because you know, some like, oh no, they want to make it this sort of. It's why why lower the price right now? They're getting so much more because they want to sell a thousand times as much. Yeah, and I think I think I think we will see the fake meat wars will have will be about to are about to begin. I mean, they're already <laughs> and Brian's already the first casualty. Exactly. <laughs> oh no! Oh jeez! <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Uh, you don't have to be a casualty of your <laughs> own ignorance if you head over to Patreon.com/slash/WeirdThings. That is where you can support this very show, folks. I'm working while I'm on vacation right now. Me and Andrew are both out of the country by the time that you are listening to this, and yet we are here entertaining you. That's the kind of hustle. That you can expect when you are a patron at patreon.com slash weird things. Head on over there right now. Thank you to everybody who has already. And thank you to all those who will going forward. So uh, just do a, a really quick post hot take on the whole fake meat thing. Uh, I heard a, I watched a really good speech by Steve Jerviston, who's been an investor in a lot of this stuff. SpaceX, everything big, big on the whole meat substitutes, all that. And he talked about how. During the days of slavery, 
slave owners and they would would avoid going to the ports when the slave ships came in because they did not want to see the ships in the conditions of the horrific environment in which brought people to there. And they just wanted yeah. to think like, ah, you're more, 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 more prisoners with jobs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, and his, his corollary is that like now, nah, like, you know, we eat meat, we like meat, but I don't really need to visit an abattoir. I don't really need to know how that works. And that we may eventually get to the point with really good substitutes that Several decades now, like yeah, nah, that eating meat's not doesn't make so much sense now, and it's kind of kind of like, ah, cows are for petting zoos. Yeah, the, uh, uh, it, it's interesting when you think in terms of uh, there, there's these uh, I don't know counterintuitive moments you realize where it's like once we have this renaissance then that means there'll be so much fewer cows. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, like we're, we're going to let the cows die off and we're going to refuse to let them breed so that fewer and fewer of them and those that do will get will, will die in the wild or whatever. But then the flip flip side was, uh, I remember somebody posted a picture of a bunch of venison they were cutting up and he says, oh, I love, I love deer meat because it's uh, uh, all natural and cruelty free. And uh, uh, which you would think like cruelty free, it's like, uh, oh, well, a fully mature deer is going to die eventually, probably of, you know, disease, infection, and all that stuff. This way, he just lived his life having a rad time and then just went to sleep instantly. <laughs> like, <laughs> So what, is he just, like, euthanizing deer in the woods? Well, like, I, mean, I mean, by shooting, you know, by shooting them and taking them yeah. out. But, but like, like, that is, a, I think, an objectively less cruel way for a, a deer to live than, than uh, factory farming with uh with cows i mean which which one of those lives would you rather have i mean i, I don't know to, to me to me they're they're kind of splitting hairs but uh I, I i can see where you're going like yeah. i can i can i can definitely pick up what you're putting down but i i i don't know i mean look i, I i've just made peace with the idea specifically considering like i i've been around a lot of the very specific literature and arguments uh for for a vegan lifestyle uh i'm just like no look i'm i'm a I'm a killer, baby. <laughs> this is what I do. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, that argument about like yeah, the deer like makes sense, but then you think about it like, what do we really know? Are the deer like like is ba- man's in the forest? Man's in the forest. And like, yeah. Oh no! Oh no! Let's run! We gotta hide. Okay, I'm hiding. Just be very, very still. And they're like, oh, look at that peaceful deer. He's like, oh my god! I'm a god! I'm gonna die! I'm gonna die! I'm gonna die! You know? Ah, got it hit! I can't move, but I'm alive. Oh my god! They're slicing open tell, my stomach. Tell my wife. Tell my children. Yeah. I, oh god! I see what I wanted to do. <laughs> Cruelty Bam- free. <laughs> Bambi two is really weird, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Did you say hear me too? No, Bambi too. Oh, yeah. Bambi really too. <laughs> you just heard a complete. It's like I was trying to figure out like deers are organizing, be like, hey guys, it's not cool that humans are killing us. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, you know what I'm gonna do tomorrow? I'm gonna take out one of their car. Front of them and stop them. Disaster today as another deer bomber, <laughs> suicide bomber, <laughs> dove in front of a car. It's like, ah, oh, well, hey man, I'm gonna go eat their garden. <laughs> 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 their can, their campaign of harassment continues. <laughs> uh, so, uh, hey, um. There's an asteroid heading towards Earth. It's going to annihilate everything. What are we going to do? There are different there are different theories. Uh, one is, you know, you send up a nuke or whatever. It's like, uh, okay. But uh, the one I liked the most was have a cloud of satellites that can go to intercept and create a mass drive, which is you chip off a piece of rock and you thro- throw it off to the side, and you keep doing that, and each one... Uh, veers it off course but but what would we do if we heard that today probably die i mean yeah or start a patreon drive (laughs) you don't need your money anymore um but guys no i mean like it it's happening now like 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 tomorrow tomorrow how big is the asteroid yeah, because I got um, a flight at like eleven um, thirty. <laughs> again, I, I don't always read all the details. This one um, is uh, two hundred meters across. Is that why my flight was canceled tonight? That's pretty okay. Two hundred meters across. That's a couple of football fields. That seems big. That seems like uh, it would it would make a big loud well, thing. Expect to hit between Tokyo and Copenhagen in twenty four days. Man, Tokyo and Copenhagen. 
So wait, hey, that put us. Is that Canada or us? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was, uh, Which way? Uh, wait, co- co- Tokyo and Copenhagen okay. means somewhere in Asia Russia? or Russia. Yeah. yeah. Or, or anywhere between them. So for background, this is actually a drill being run right now by NASA and ESA going, hey, let's go through the scenario of like we listen to this awesome podcast called Weird Things. So they talk about this all the time. No, we need to do this. They're doing a scenario of like, hey, what would we do? What's the plans? And they're doing a whole, you know, kind of conference exercise on a hypothetical impact. Oh, that's uh, this, great. They have to make this does not describe, you know, a real one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, hilar- that's hilarious! It, uh, like, oh, big, it's not real. Big red banner, <laughs> like it's like not enough, man. Make sure to also have just a giant overlay <laughs> that says that says uh, uh, fake. So this is all the information that they are running on. They they have published the information that they are running on and exactly what the threat is, when it is scheduled to hit, uh, all, all all that. Yes. Uh, so so. How long? How long do they have? Like, like um, in this scenario? Yeah. They, by the way, way to rip off our bit. Put together a scenario and try to go through it. <laughs> yeah, they have like uh, I think 24, 24 days is what they're doing. So they're right now they're doing the conference, the IA Planetary Defense Conference. Um, and actually, it's something I talked to somebody who'd participated in one of these before about the whole idea of like, you know, it'd be kind of cool to, you know do a documentary about this, you know? So if you type in planetary defense, you can find yourself on the page that Bryce just showed for us. And they show the, and they show the, the whole exercise day zero, day one, day two, day three, day four, they list out an asteroid is discovered March 26th at a magnitude 21.1 confirmed be falling day. And like the, all the facts as they have, like what the monitoring systems are doing and whatnot, what, how would you keep track of it? How do you cooperate? What would you do? You know, you're trying to figure out more precisely where it's going to impact, what you need to do, et cetera. Well, it, well and great. so as they work out those ideas, it occurs to me that there needs to be a person or set of persons who decide what the results are on various uh, things that they need. Yeah. To, that, like they have a dungeon master. I, like, like They do. <laughs> like basically the dungeon master says like, okay, you call Japan. They only have two rockets available and they want $70 million. <laughs> Neil deGrasse for Tyson rolling dice somewhere. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not effective. <laughs> uh, so I wonder if this is, is this a real time exercise where they are getting new information laid out to them? As as it comes, yeah, or I, w- is I would it, imagine uh, just a big puzzle that they're trying to figure out together. I I would from from what it said because it has it has a timeline, and if it's a multi day conference, I would imagine that it is like a big game of D anD D where it's like, okay, first thing, uh, let's take action now. Uh, let's mobilize this this and that satellite. Turn these two, uh, you know, uh, uh, cut off these projects. Well, because I would imagine also that now it's like, all right, well, now you guys have to f- try to figure out where it's going and, 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 you know, like they're trying to do stuff before we are able to ascertain exactly what it's doing and where it's going. And it's like, like they're matching their results up to uh, other preset information. Yeah. And I would imagine that like, if on day one, you uh, say point this satellite at it and see what we can find out, you have to wait until day two to get those results out and then find out like, Oh wait, no, that that's not what we need at all. Let's do another one. And so it, 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 it seems like this would be, Uh, A lot of fun. (laughs) Yeah. They have, you know, part of what it is is using our systems, the ESA systems, and all the different tools we have to figure out what they could tell us. Because besides the satellites, you have ground-based telescopes, things like this. And I think it's, yeah, it's a great exercise to see, like, if this is going to happen, who are we going to talk to? What? How do we organize? How do we? Let's run through this whole scenario. Mm-hmm. One of the things that happens all the time is, you know, like if you sometimes you drive by an airport and you'll see a bunch of fire trucks and people out there, and they're actually just surrounding an airplane and they're just doing a practice drill of like what to do if there's a problem, and that's a great thing to do. And so here, hopefully, it'll it'll be very insightful and they'll figure out, you know, like, you know, well, are we going to tell the people or not? Yeah, I think uh, in this scenario, the asteroid will possibly impact Earth in eight years. Uh, On the day one part of the site, they've even made a fake press release uh, about the possibility of a collision uh, in the coming Exercise only. Exercise only, it says on either ends of the corners. (laughs) Uh, This is awesome. Oh, so this is a long-term campaign. Well, I think the maybe the conference is a week long, but 
Yeah, the conference a week long, but yeah, I think that the goal is to say, you know, how would you confirm it? How what would we do? What would be the steps to confirm it? Whatever strategically, I don't think there's any steps to like. And then this is how we're going to blow it up. But more like, yeah. hey, how are the different groups going to work together to confirm it? How do we get as much information as we can early on? Mm-hmm. It's a bit like a like a model UN thing. Like imagine mm-hmm. hours or days, and it's yeah. like uh, you have to make those phone calls and get those agreements and all that stuff. That's yeah. cool. Um, glad to see they're doing that. Yeah. So uh, what's funny is I was just thinking like, well, of course, the best thing is to have a defensive network of satellites ready to, to help out in this kind of situation, which makes me think uh, as soon as we put more stuff in space, go SpaceX, which made me think of the fact that um, uh, after we talked about it, uh, SpaceX still has not talked at all about the Explody uh, crew capsule. Uh, they in, released a statement today. Oh, they did. Oh, good. Yeah. Are, are they? Yeah. They're the they're the the head designer there. He's you know it's it's an ongoing investigation trying to figure out. But they said yeah, this they they described. Yeah, it exploded. We're still trying to figure out what the heck happened. We know these are the conditions it happened. Like was before you know they're they're firing up like the super jacko thruster, thrusters, but other than that, they just are going through the data. You know, trying to figure out what yeah, happened. Yeah, I, I guess just you know being on the outside every day that they don't have an announcement makes me a more nervous fan of this operation because it, it, it would be implied that they're not talking because there are things they haven't figured out yet. Well, yeah. And I, I mean, they're, and also it's like, they're not, it's not, it's Na- it's SpaceX, it's NASA. They're trying to do a comprehensive examination of this. It's not so much a rush to our satisfy our curiosity as much as they need to understand very deeply, because if there's a fundamental problem there, then that's going to be oh, yeah. an issue. Well, keep in mind, I'm not saying they should hurry up. I'm saying I am getting sad, <laughs> like, because yeah. the, the, the longer it takes, the, the less of a whoopsie doodle, uh, Joe left a, an errant hex nut mm-hmm. in there. Yeah. From what I understand, and I, this is all anecdotal, is that they had it on a test stand that was a vibrating test stand, and this was the capsule was already in the ocean that had saltwater corrosion, and they were vibrating this thing well beyond the limits of what they expected the thing to encounter, and then they went to go fire, and it went boom. Got it. Not a good outcome, but you know there, it might be, well, that situation something's never going to encounter in the real world, or do we? Don't know. So, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's the one thing that I that I do feel a little bit better is that this was – a, a recovered from the water right. thing, which they they don't want optimally to do, and if if the reality is all right, if it goes in the drink, then we got to build a new one. Right. Then you know that that still uh, leaves their main solution, which is that they want them to land on land. Right. Right. They want them to slowly re-enter onto a platform. Uh. Well, I mean, they're they're still they're, these will probably just always do we want land at sea, but they're just not going to be reused. Yeah, you know, they're yeah. just one and done. Uh, you know, we had some cool this week. I think, um, you know, we're getting the 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 virtual reality device war is heating up. Oh yeah, it's, have, uh, uh, Steam just released theirs, right? Or Valve's? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Valve, Valve released their their competitor to basically everybody else, which looks pretty formidable. Oculus announced updates to theirs, and also they formally the the launch date for the Oculus Quest, which is their four hundred dollar standalone VR system that has full room sensing. Ooh. And the the reviews of it are pretty good. Pretty yeah, good. Yeah, I, I I did watch one of those demos. It was pretty cool because you don't have any lighthouses. You can actually uh, remember early on we talked about like what it would be like to be out in a field and just a bunch of people are running around because they're busy slaying dragons and stuff. The Oculus Quest, uh, it, it, it in a rudimentary form, seems like it's the closest to that we've ever we've ever seen. Yeah, we're watching some video of it here. What's cool about the Oculus Quest versus, and I've got the few other, what, which one do I have here? Um, this is the Go, um, or this is the sand, this is the Daydream, which is, you know, it's pretty cool, but it, it has room sensing. This is the, uh, this came out, you know, this was one of the big releases with the room sensing and stuff as I wiped the dust off of it. But the controller is sort of your kind of regular, just point and clicky kind of thing. It's not like a room sensing controller. But Oculus's version of this is supposed to, you know, their their competitor to that's got a lot more, a bit more horsepower behind it, and the room sensing seems a lot more advanced, and the knuckle controllers seem way more sophisticated. And and you're basically a lot like what the first generation Oculus was capable of. These can now do. 
So. Yeah, and uh, but the specifically, I, I think on the specs for the Valve new release, it seemed like it was roughly the same resolution. Uh, it had a wider wider field of vision. It had a simpler single cord. Um, and of course the knuckles controllers, uh, and it's a compatible with the Vive technology. So if you have the lighthouses or, uh, those controllers, it'll still work with those. So is this, it, this does not need to be hooked into a computer. Is it still, it does. It, it, it does. does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. This is, this is basically, uh, if, 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 if your HTC Vive is a little bit long in the tooth, uh, this, this is your this new is your upgrade, your new, new. Yeah. Uh, yeah, built-in headphones, all that stuff. Although the latest version of the Vive has had that too. Is it a? Uh, is it, is it wired or wireless? Uh, uh, it's wired. The the it's not headphones. They're actually speakers. Oh, okay. So they are. So they don't rest on your ears for extended comfort. I guess. Got it. And I guess also uh, for for local outside VR awareness. Yeah. Although I like getting kind of lost all the way. Yeah, I I think it's I think that's a it's a nice incremental sort of evolution to it. There, there was I read a report that was sort of funny. They criticized there's a dongle that allows you to take all the cords and go to one single, you know, cord, yeah. but it's the one that plugs right into your computer, and so you still have all of the cords going out the back. Yeah, you know, and it's not like the single tether to it. Where I'm. I'm not a gamer, and so like I'm excited about like the single of just put the thing on. It's not hooked up to anything, and you're free. That's, you know, and I think that's where you know I think the future is going to be for a lot of people will be just that. Standard. Oh yeah, and and considering for my taste as a believer in the HTC Vive, the high end of that industry has yet to really pay out. Like I, I've yet to have the like fully immersive RPG experience that I kind of would have hoped for. Uh, the best stuff that uh, that has come out of it is stuff that is lower fi. Like you can do the Star Trek Bridge Commander Beat thing, Saber, or... like and Beat Saber, like mm -hmm. all that you can do on the Oculus, and and they're like advertising it with these games that I think are the most fun, uh, which is I think somewhat disappointing for all the equipment and money that you put into the wired solution that has a better graphics engine because it's like for uh, be it a failure of development or money or just the market not being there i've yet to dive into like a three four hour game that really held my attention for three four hours because it was unfolding in a cool and interesting way so we'll see hmm. gentlemen what do you picks indeed i got a bit of a a, a a process pick here because I've been on the road and had to uh, kind of decamp and do everything from my laptop uh, instead of my my rig at home. And uh, I got to say, part of the Adobe suite, Adobe Audition, I've been using it a lot more and I have found it to be very, very, very robust. Uh, it is something that I kind of shied away from because everything that we'd done, I mean, I think our, I think it's safe to say that our tribe of podcasters is very live to tape, do yeah. everything uh, uh, going into whatever the dumbest possible, easiest, like least screw upable possible recording solution uh, that we can possibly have, and so I've stayed away from it because that is our that is our our coven. <laughs> this is how we live. This is how we make our money. Uh, but I gotta say, it's been really great learning it and using it, and uh, I feel like the shows have taken less of a hit and and require less physical setup on the road. Uh, than, than they would have if I was running it into a little mixer and playing all of my sound effects off an iPad and stuff like that. So yeah. were, you, were you doing editing beforehand? Or was that all just uh, Audacity? Or? All, yeah, if there was editing, it was like trimming off the beginning and the end mm -hmm. a little bit, and maybe if there was something in the middle, I could snip it out, but it yeah. was all into Audacity, mm -hmm. and now it is into Audition, and I'm just excited to continue to dig into it. But uh, it's it's you know it runs... Fast on my MacBook, it exports really easily. I'm able to do effects and, and just sweeten the audio just that little bit to make it a little bit more professional, which when you're on the road, that's the stuff that suffers is is just those little things. And I've been able to uh, keep it high quality uh, thanks to Adobe Audition. I, you know, I, I got that because of the, the, the full plan. And the other day I was, said, I need to do something. Like, I'll just go do this in GarageBand. And I opened up GarageBand and I'm like, I don't, this is... I'm like, oh, I'm going to add a sound effect. Like, did I add it? I don't know. I can't tell from this new version if I've done this or not or how many of layers I've got. I'm like, screw it. I'm going to go use Adobe Audition. 
which should be the exact opposite effect that yeah. GarageBand has. A hundred percent. I I used to be a believer in GarageBand. That that was like where I edited, especially in the early days. I edited all the podcasts that I did in in GarageBand, mm-hmm. and it's I don't know what the hell's going on with GarageBand. I I I've, I've I had the exact same experience that you had, Andrew. And that are they are they pulling a Final Cut X? You know, well, it's I, always been casual. Right. Well, no, no, no. It's not even casual. To me, it's more complicated than casual now because they, they, they've added a few more things for music and, and they want to gear it more toward music. So in terms of uh, audio podcast stuff, it's just a little bit too kludgy to be super easy. Yeah. And now because I'm also working on a PC sometimes and a Mac sometimes, Adobe Audition allows me to export Cross all those platform. files. And now I can just take the file that I used on my PC and put it right on my Mac. Hmm. It's pretty easy. Yeah, I was just, I open up GarageBand. I'm like, I don't know. I have a file here. I think I applied effect. How many effects are, I don't know. I'm like, I don't, I'm like, if I'm going to bother digging into this, let's go back to Audition. Yeah. yeah. I, and that's a big fail. A big fail that the, the, the easiest to use application is harder to use than a pro application. I, sh- so. I, I need to learn Audition. I, I use Premiere even for like, Trending Lemon, which is an audio-only podcast, I edit that in Premiere. Oh, really? Just because I use Premiere all the time for all the video stuff, and mm-hmm. so I'm much more used to. It's easy. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. You you you'll catch on pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. So uh, somebody made a recommendation to me, and I got the audiobook, and so far I'm really digging it. It's a shortish one, like maybe seven and a half hours, but it's called Rock Breaks Scissors. A Practical Guide to Outguessing and Outwitting Almost Everybody. And it begins with uh, the construction of a guessing machine. Uh, basically, a machine that just watches you uh, predict a coin flip, and uh, it pays attention to how often you go, you know, three heads in a row, and then you get nervous, and then you switch to the other. And uh, this is back in, like, I want to say the 1960s. Um, I think it was, I forget whether it's Bell Labs or IBM or whatever. But uh, pretty quick, this thing uh, had a statistically significant advantage because humans, we have those biases that we move in predictable ways, even when we're trying to be unpredictable. And uh, I'm really enjoying it. It's a a good book by uh, William Poundstone. And William Poundstone used to write like the bigger secrets revealed and all that and all that other series. Remember him? No, I, I, don't, I don't know. Bigger secrets revealed. Yeah, reveal. Look at the William. Look at the William Poundstone. Look at the other books he's written, and you will see a a. How would you move Mount Fuji? The myth of fair value. Prisoner's dilemma. Prisoner's dilemma. How would you move Mount Fuji? Uh-huh. Are you smart enough to work at Google? Doomsday calculation. Gave me the vote. vote. Yeah, no, these all look great. Uh, well, hopefully, if I enjoy this one, I'll keep diving in. Big Book of Secrets. That was his uh, big, huge one back in the nineties. So oh, interesting. Right on. Only a that quarter was, for like, the hard made it into the remainders, like of all of like the bookstores and stuff. But yeah, so cool, prolific writer, excellent. Yeah. I have a pick. Uh, this is a short pick. Um, I actually recommended it in Cord Killers. Oh my god! This week, highest, highest, uh, backing up your play on this one. <laughs> uh, this is a new Netflix sketch comedy show. Netflix hasn't done too too many sketch comedy shows, and this is their newest. It's I think you should leave with uh, Tim Robinson, and uh, I, I think. The one word I would use to describe the type of comedy would be aggressive, maybe. I, I, no, I, I would say uh, they're one-note sketches that waste no time th- on preamble. Sure. They get in and they get out, and it, it, it they're great. Yeah, they're, they're very fast. It's also like the third Netflix series like this month that's come out that is a 15-minute format instead of 30 minutes or an hour or something. Um, and I think it's the best of all of those. Uh, but it's it's very funny. Uh, um, Akiva Shiver from Lonely Island direct is is directing it. Uh, he also directed uh, the Michael Bolton comedy Bang Bang. Uh, yeah, uh, special. the uh, Michael Bolton's Big Sexy Va- uh, Valentine's Day special. Yeah, uh, it's it's very funny and uh, it's a very like low buy in because it's only like seven 15 minute episodes. Well, and plus also, you know how some TV shows people are like, oh, just get through episode four or whatever. It's like, no, this one, give it three minutes on the first episode. Sure. The first You're, sketch is very Yeah. Good. I've, I, I've seen uh, two and a half sketches <laughs> and I would describe the comedy as you get the premise mm-hmm. immediately. Sometimes in the first sentence or like two sentences and then either it is an escalation or an exploration of the joke, but it is kamikaze. Like, it, it yeah. goes and escalates and escalates and escalates and then just explodes 
and then you're on to the next one. So it was uh, it was very 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 funny. I would I would compare it. Oh man, I don't even know what I would. It does feel a lot it's, like uh, the the Michael Bolton special. Yeah, it's really like that. And it's a little Tim and Eric-y with how it extrapolates on all of the situations. You know, uh, I think it was in some interview where they were kind of talking about the type of humor, and it's a lot of like embarrassing yourself in public and then doubling down to like try to save face, mm-hmm. right? Like, oh no, I'm not wrong. I'm the this is a pool door. Yeah, but that's then, yeah, but that's but that's you know, it, it's kind of uh, like. That's more like, like like the like Judd Apatow or, or Will Ferrell like kind of like okay well I'm wrong but I'm gonna be arrogant right like sure. I'm going to I'm going to embarrass my way out of this yeah uh, there's a and, great and, 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 and it's it's not quite as absurd as Tim and Eric where like right. Tim and Eric would often get very abstract it's like oh here's a thing well here's a cat that uh, is like eating another cat and right. and let's talk about that for or let's say a nonsense word over and over again mm-hmm. uh this is like it's grounded in reality and then just goes yeah. into very weird places uh, at least in the except, two and a half sketches I saw except for one one very specific sketch about Scrooge having to save the future <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay right I'm, I'm I'm super bummed to watch yes. it because I love yeah. love 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 sketch comedy and uh, uh, everything I saw at least at the beginning is is good and also it's like hey look it doesn't you know as William Shakespeare said don't waste my time <laughs> it's it's quick yeah so that's uh, I think you should leave uh, check it I watched those little like Netflix autoplay previews which mm. I hate with every fiber of my existence particularly because it's like. Sometimes I just want to leave the TV on and scroll through there, and you don't want to have like things just autoplay and sound at you. Is there a way to turn that off, or no. is that? No, I don't open the Netflix app as much because of it, um, because I'm like I don't want that. But, but that crap aside, I watched the little preview. I'm like, well, this doesn't look funny at all. It's not a good trailer. <laughs> you know? Netflix like... makes bad trailers, y'all. Yeah, dude. Yeah. So I'm glad to hear. Glad to hear that. Yeah. Uh. My pick is I've been listening to this book again. It's by Chris Anderson. It came out like oh, like 10 years ago, whatever. Some of it's out of date, but a lot of it's still interesting, kind of getting the economics, and that is Free by Chris Anderson. Oh, that was a good one. Yeah, I liked it quite yeah. a bit. And it's, you know, it's interesting to talk about some companies that maybe aren't around or their models didn't work out, but he does get into the economics of like – you know, that we are this era of like, you know, some of the biggest things we have out there now, you know, Facebook is a quote free service. Google is giant and it's free. You know, Snap is there and free and YouTube is free, you know, and, and just the rise of these companies that provide these free things and how it's just gone so beyond the, the models from before. So, uh, it's worth listening to or reading again. I mean that that's I feel like we're now on an appropriate time away from that book's release that I, I feel like I would put that in the like if you want to understand like a a, a a moment in time. Like like that book was well talked about when it was released and I think you're you're right. Uh, if you look at like what has happened past then, like there's all these free products, right? Like that have dominated the the landscape. I mean, there was there was a time when there was a debate like, oh, is Facebook going to start charging? Are they yeah. going to start charging? You know, that was and now of course, of course not because they, they they need everybody using it. But there was a time when you're like, oh, and this makes a very good argument of like why they wouldn't or why it wouldn't make sense. So, anyhow, uh, that's my pick. It's been weird. Tight well, pros. Tight. 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 Tight.